Don't miss your chance to register for IISE's virtual meetup at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, April 22nd. With the help of the Remo platform, you'll feel like you're attending a network event in person again, virtually hopping from table to table and floor to floor as you network with fellow industrial and systems engineers in a dynamic, interactive online setting. IISE's virtual meetup features industry leaders from the Council on Industrial and Systems Engineering, also known as CISE, representing companies like IBM, Intervision, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts, Intel, and more. You'll also have the opportunity to meet leaders in IISE societies, divisions, and student chapters so you can form lifelong career connections. Seating is limited, so sign up now for this event taking place at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, April 22nd. Learn more at www.iise.org slash virtual meetup, all one word. This is Problem Solved, the IISE podcast, where we talk to industrial and systems engineers about their work, ideas, and solutions. Hello, gang, and welcome to another episode of Problem Solved, the IISE podcast. I'm David Brandt, digital strategist for IISE. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing engineers and entrepreneurship with our guest, founder and president of Pro Planner, Dave Sly. Dave is also the inaugural director of entrepreneurship in the College of Engineering at Iowa State University, in which he leads the new Engineering Entrepreneurship Initiative. The aim of the initiative is to empower students to develop an entrepreneurial mindset to become innovators, leaders, and difference makers in their communities. Dave has served in the Industrial and Manufacturing Systems Engineering Department at Iowa State since 2002, is a licensed professional engineer, and holds bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees in industrial engineering, as well as an MBA with a finance and marketing emphasis, all from Iowa State. And for anyone in search of a fun fact, the mascot for Iowa State is Cy the Cardinal, but the sports teams are referred to as the Iowa State Cyclones. Dave, welcome to Problem Solved. Hey, thanks a lot, David. I really, uh, really appreciate you giving attention to this very important topic of entrepreneurship and industrial engineering. Absolutely. Happy to do it. First, though, I wanted to start this conversation with a simple but direct question. What makes an entrepreneur, whether they're an engineer or not? I think um, that an entrepreneur has to come to the marketplace with a unique uh, idea, whether that is uh, a product, whether that's a service, whether that's a way of um, charging money for your product and service, you know, moving from, hey, don't buy it, you can just rent it. Uh, so I think that it isn't just about a business. I, while an entrepreneur, you know, certainly the first McDonald's in Russia might be considered very entrepreneurial. I don't think just because you own a dry cleaning business in a big community per se makes you an entrepreneur. But I think an entrepreneur who really sees a gap in a product or service offering in the marketplace. Um, where people can be better served with a different approach. That's what really differentiates an entrepreneur from a business person. But I also want to add that as opposed to an innovator, an entrepreneur has a plan to make money. In other words, it it has to be a product or service offering that has at least the opportunity to eventually uh, pay for itself and be sustainable. Pro Planner is a familiar company to us at IIC as it's previously been an exhibitor at the annual conference and expo over the years. And we'll certainly talk about the story behind its founding. But I did want to ask you first about your role as the director of entrepreneurship within the College of Engineering at Iowa State. What are you tasked with and how do you help engineering students in that role? This is a a new position at Iowa State, even though I've actually been kind of uh, a mascot for uh, engineering and entrepreneurship ever since I started my first company uh, as a uh, junior uh, in 1983 (laughs) at Iowa State University in the College of Engineering. Uh, Really, ever since that point, uh, I and and others like me uh, have spoken many times at student events uh, about uh, this entrepreneurial track as a viable way, either right out of school or before you graduate, or you know, even maybe you've been in industry for a while, as, as either a full-time or even a part-time side gig to bring in money, you know, starting your own business is, is really a possible viable uh, thing to do uh, because it's kind of scary to some people when you first think about it. And so, um, uh, you know, really you could say I've been an ambassador of, the, of this entrepreneurship and engineering, certainly at Iowa State. 
um, since the mid 1980s. But I actually didn't get officially appointed to this role until a year and a half ago uh, when the College of Engineering decided to expand our focus on entrepreneurship. Actually, the Agricultural College had done this almost 10 years earlier and had a director of entrepreneurship and had developed a center and done some amazing things. Uh, but the Engineering College uh, really never saw, thought of it much of as a focus. So it's something that we're really excited about. Um, I've been able to create what's called a fellows program where uh, we have a uh, faculty member who's very entrepreneurial in each of the engineering departments. We have eight engineering departments at Iowa State and uh, 9,000 students in the College of Engineering to help us really mentor uh, students in entrepreneurship and develop programs in our courses, help students um, identify as entrepreneurs. They may be business people, they may have created a great idea, but never thought of themselves as an entrepreneur. Help students who know they want to be an entrepreneur, who, who are trying to be an entrepreneur, maybe whether they have an idea or not, learn how, how to come together with a product and, and how to identify its market viability. And we've even developed, in addition to some activities in existing courses, we've developed two courses in the college. Uh, one is more of a classroom-oriented course. The other one's more of a follow-on project course where students can learn about engineering entrepreneurship, building prototypes, experimenting with market focus groups and validating your ideas in the marketplace, even a little bit on business planning, although we have some companion courses that we recommend to our students in the College of Business as part of our university-wide minor of entrepreneurship. But lastly, I'll say that Iowa State has really been very focused on innovation and entrepreneurship. In fact, our president, Wendy Winterstein, is really responsible for our Innovate at Iowa State campaign, where we really want to be seen as the place to go for students who want to innovate and be entrepreneurial. Um, our motto has always been since our founding, science with practice. And I can't think of a better way to manifest that than through uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Let me ask this. How hard is the sale to the student you're trying to convert, the ones who have that potential but don't realize it. When you introduce that possibility to them, uh, do they generally react positively and they think, oh yeah, I am an entrepreneur, or do you have to kind of push them a little bit? That's a great question. Um, one thing I've learned over the years is that there are really two kinds of students. There's those that want to be an entrepreneur, but maybe don't have an idea yet, and that's okay but they want to do it. Uh, maybe their parents were entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe they have a history of entrepreneurship in their family. Um, who, who knows you know, what sparked that fire, but they've got the fire and they want to learn and they want to be involved. And of course, uh, helping them um, is, is in a way easier because of course they, they have the motivation, they have the energy, um, they lack the idea and, and, and maybe sometimes you know, some focus. And, and that's where where we come in. But the other group, the group that was very much like myself, which I can relate to back in the uh, 80s, are those people that are already doing entrepreneurial things. But they don't think of themselves as an entrepreneur. You know, when I started my first business, uh, the PC had just come out. And so I was doing training. I, I taught people how to use spreadsheets, word processors, databases. In fact, eventually, a program called AutoCAD came out um, on the PC version 1.4, circa 1983-84, and I would teach people how to use AutoCAD. And for many people, I was the first person they ever met that used a computer. I, I was the first person to show them how to use a computer, but it was largely training, right? So is that entrepreneurship? You know, I'm just teaching people how to use programs. And then, oh, by the way, sometimes they'd say, hey, would you mind writing me a little program in, in Lotus, which was the spreadsheet of the day? Would you, would you write me a little program in AutoCAD to do this, to automate this? Could you help me with this? Uh, I wrote, helped somebody write a CAM system to convert, you know, CAD parts, uh, 2D CAD layouts into... Uh, CNC mill parts, and probably wrote one of the very first CAM period manufacturing systems for AutoCAD back in 1984, you know, a year after AutoCAD launched. But I never thought of that, right? As a business, I was just making money to go to school. <laughs> and uh, in that case, nobody really ever called and came and told me, hey, you know, you've got a business, you need to name it, right? Maybe you should uh, have a separate financial account to keep track of the money because you're going to have to pay taxes. You know, I'm just a college student with a side gig. 
And uh, those are the kinds of students that um, you, we really have to seek out. And, and that's probably the harder part and, and convince to them that they they'll benefit. Right. From being involved in courses on entrepreneurship to be better business people, to identify opportunities better, to help understand the financial options, you know, how you're going to charge for this. And, you know, oh, by the way, uh, you can you know write some of this stuff off your taxes. And oh, by the way, you need to pay taxes. Right? And what marketing is all about, because let's face it, it most of us engineers take very little business courses, if, if any, of course, industrial engineers more than most. But those students are the hardest to convince because while they probably need the help the most and they're the closest to actually really making something happen, if they aren't, frankly, already, we have several students bringing in over $100,000 a year as full-time college students, but they're busy, right? I mean, they're doing their business. They're, they're working 40 hours a week, 60 hours a week on their business. They're going to classes. They're taking 18 credits. They Last thing you need is somebody else to say, oh, you also need to do these competitions. Oh, you also <laughs> you know, should consider this additional class. And oh, here's something going on tonight. It's it's fun. It's exciting. It's And uh, in some cases, what I ended up doing is, is doing a little side help for them. Uh, being uh, an ear, being a mentor, uh, because they simply can't devote the time uh, to uh, formal instruction. If that was something that had occurred in the era in which I went to college, which was early 2000s, I think I would have made a false choice of having to pick one or the other. It's amazing now, and and we'll talk a little bit about the technology later on, but it's amazing now what that has done to allow or at least convince college students to be able to do both, go to school, start a business. Yeah, you know, technology has enabled opportunities for students that with very little capital, which you got to assume most students don't have any money. I certainly didn't have any money. And I'll I also say did that, not have the money. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you didn't have money. I, you know, nine out of the 10 students, probably actually 99 out of the 100 students that I work with have little to no money, you know, and, and you know what, uh, when you go back in the history of successful entrepreneurs in technology, Bill Gates, right, and Jobs and Zuckerberg and, you know, just Elon Musk, pick your people. How many of those successful entrepreneurs had money? And you'll find none of them did. Not one of them. OK, so in a way, money may not help. <laughs> it may hurt. Uh, there's nothing like being destitute and having to succeed. I know I had that feeling uh, to drive someone to do things. Let me also say one other thing about what I the group of people I just mentioned. They were all 19 and 20 years old. All of them. As I tell students that I meet who are scared about being an entrepreneur, I, I say, look, almost every product you use. Every software product you use, the Dell computer, the Apple computer you use, the operating system, every software product that you use, every hardware technology product you use was invented by someone your age. In fact, being old is an inhibitor, right? And I think that because as you get older, you pretend to put boxes around things. You, you know how the world works or you think you know how the world works. So you just assume things don't, can't happen. You know, Michael Dell, when he started his PC company in his dorm room going up against IBM, had no second thoughts that he couldn't win. But of course, everyone who was old, like me at the time, knew he would lose. There's no way he could win. You can't go up against IBM as a college student, but yet he did, right? You, you can't get into the space market and 10 years later be the number one space company in the world. <laughs> but Elon Musk did, right? Yep, that's true. <laughs> so out of nothing, out of nothing. He beat Boeing. He beat Lockheed. I mean, we've been in the space race for 50, 60, 70 years, right? And yet here's a kid that, you know, kid, I mean, he's obviously an older man, but he started PayPal. He started a lot of companies as a kid, as a 19 year old with a vision of getting into the space market. And, and he's done more than anyone else in that space. So I, I just say to you, on, you know, on that, you're right. Technology. When he wrote PayPal, he didn't need a bunch of money. He needed a computer and a brain. That is it. He wrote the tool. He put it online. People used it. He made a billion dollars. <laughs> okay. So obviously, if you're going to start a space company, or you're going to start a new car company, you need money. But there's a car company, by the way, started by a 20-year-old kid in Europe who um, also had no money. And he just took an old BMW, which, by the way, Elon Musk did as well. 
and added electric motor and batteries to it and created his first electric car and then just continued to go. His company is called Rimrack. It's now a multi-hundred million dollar uh, exotic uh, car company for, for battery car company. But it's all on a common thread, right? You've got talent, you've got time, you've got energy, you've got motivation. And if you can beg, borrow and steal low cost materials or a computer, um, you, can, you can be very successful. And so that's why I think we see college students, engineering students, uh, able to be highly successful uh, with um, in markets, right, where capital isn't the differentiator or having $100 million in the bank doesn't help you. So I'd say, you know, 40 years of technological innovation, go for broke, still seems to be the phrase that pays, so to speak. <laughs> yes, it does. You know, it's kind of funny. One of my mentors, um, I was probably 23 at the time. So I'd been doing my business for about four years. And I had a mentor and I was getting a little worried. I, I'd hired some employees, right? And, and, I, and all of a sudden I was starting to feel the stress of actually running a business. Because before it was just me mainly. And I was thinking about getting out and quitting. And my mentor, who was probably about 40 years old at the time, said to me, what have you got to worry about? You know, and, and I said, you know, so you lose. So what? Right? I mean, what are you losing? You're, you're not married. You don't have kids. You don't have a mortgage. You, know, you don't have a family to worry about. You're just an independent guy. The worst thing that can happen to you is you lose your computer and your motorcycle. Right. And you're back to living where you live, going to school, doing what every other college does every way. The, the worst thing that can happen to you is you become a college student like everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> Only with the experience, right, of having created a company, done something, developed customers. Look, I mean, at that time, I was selling to John Deere. I was selling to Pella Windows. I was selling to Maytag washing machines. They were my customers. My mentor said to me, don't tell me that any one of those companies wouldn't hire you tomorrow, you know, if, if you're unable to make this business idea work. So anyway, he convinced me to stick with it. But yeah, it is. Uh, you're right. It's it's looking outside in. It looks like a no brainer. But when you're there in the moment, you know, living the stresses of, of that, it is uh, it, it can get to you. As I was reading up on you, the concept of the entrepreneur stood out because it wasn't one I was exposed to in my college years or even early on in my career, which was journalism. And for those who aren't familiar with it, please explain for our audience what makes one an entrepreneur and what separates them from entrepreneurs in both their profession and career. Great question. Let's face it. We have 9,000 students, uh, as I mentioned, in Iowa State in engineering. They're not all going to go out and start a company. Not every student I'm working with is going to go out and start a company. And I don't know if we need 9,000 new companies, you know, every four years uh, in our society, uh, at least not in Ames, Iowa. But what we do need, what companies come to me, literally, and I'm not, I'm not joking when I say this, companies, big companies come to me and sit me down and say, we need students who can take a new product idea, who can help us envision a new product idea, meeting a new customer need and build the next thing that's going to make our company successful. I don't care what the company is, you know, whether, you know, it's an Iowa company like John Deere or, you know, um, another company that's got a bunch of a plant in Iowa, Polaris motorcycles, you know, every year they are confronted with what do we do now, right? What's the next big product? What's the next major industry opportunity? You know, I know one thing right now that, that John Deere has publicly stated they're focused on is not just building a company that makes tractors, physical hardware, selling modified steel and rubber for all that matter, but actually a company that creates, manages data about farming, right? I mean, if you think about it, a tractor is robot, uh, either manually driven by a human or automatically driven now with auto steer on the ground that can measure the soil conditions, that can uh, measure the topology of the land and best determine you know, how to apply the seed and how to apply the chemicals. And as you harvest the crops, analyze every inch of that land or at least every foot of that land and how well it is producing the output relative to the inputs that those same machines put down, right? The point I'm bringing up here is that Envisioning these new market opportunities and not just thinking about them, but actually working with real customers, developing 
prototyping and launching these major new innovations that someday may very well be the dominant revenue source of those new businesses is exactly what entrepreneurship's all about. Being an entrepreneur is just an entrepreneur inside a company that actually has the resources to help fund and launch the idea. The only difference between entrepreneur and entrepreneur is a typical entrepreneur has no money and has no organization of people to help carry out the idea. They have to build a company and they have to hire people and train them and put them in place to do the sales and the marketing and support, which sometimes gets in the way, right, of bringing your idea to market. And uh, because, you know, it's this other business stuff, which as an entrepreneur, you can leverage usually to your value, the resources of the organization to help you out. And so for every one entrepreneur that we may create at Iowa State, we're creating 10 entrepreneurs. We're creating people who are going to companies because that company is giving them an opportunity to take a new product idea that may that they may not have thought of that somebody else may have come up with and launch it and make it successful. They're going in with sharp eyes and ears. They're looking for the opportunity within that organization to advance something. Exactly. And that's why when students come to me flustered and say, I want to be an entrepreneur so bad. And I love the stories of the entrepreneurs who are successful. And I want to be one of those really bad, but I don't have an idea. I, I lack the next great idea. And I tell them, don't worry. You know, keep your eyes and ears open, gain as much experience as you can, see as many things, co-op as many places, you know, watch as many YouTube videos, you know, learn, be excited, introduce yourself to new places, go to different countries, you know, travel abroad, work at companies, interview, get a job at a place where you can be a, an innovator, tell them you want to help them innovate and launch new products. They'll be very happy to hear that. Take these classes that teach you how to identify opportunities, how to validate opportunities, how to quickly build prototypes, uh, which are the programs that we're doing now at Iowa State. And you'll be successful. The ideas will come. You brought up YouTube. And I have to admit, even in, in my work, which I would best describe as media arts, whether it's writing, podcasting, post-production of media, that sort of thing. YouTube has been my go to resource, and it certainly wasn't one that was available to me when I first started my career. In your opinion, how much of an impact has YouTube made in entrepreneurship for this younger generation? Well, you know, there's, there's no doubt that when you look at YouTube videos and YouTube channels, that they're dominated by young people. And as I said before, that's not a coincidence, right? It's, it's the young people who are jumping on. The older people look at that and go, you can make money on YouTube. <laughs> of course, the younger <laughs> people are going, of course, you can make money. You know, three of my friends are you know, making thousands of dollars on YouTube. You know, we're definitely entering a, a unique entrepreneurial period in entertainment. David, you and I probably grew up in an era, I know I did, where, you know, TV was three local broadcast channels. I mean, if and, and they were broadcasting what they wanted to broadcast when they wanted to broadcast. And if you didn't like it, well, then you turned it off. Yep, that was it. That was your option <laughs> in life, you know? Imagine where we are today. I mean, uh, people are shutting cable down. They're, um, you know, you've got the Hulus and the, and the Netflixes and the Amazon Primes. Um, but you've also got people who are creating on the fly their own media company, right? Their own media company, their own news organizations, their own broadcasting, their own media content. I mean, we even see that within Netflix and uh, and Hulu and, and Amazon Prime, where they're actually creating their own TV shows. They're not even just streaming other people's shows. They're authoring their own content. We're seeing students and, and uh I uh, just, uh, you know, we, we talked today when, when we started this podcast, how I was talking to a student um, who's got a YouTube channel that he started. He's a student right now. And he says he makes between six and ten thousand dollars recording his experiences on trying to get old tractors and trucks and and cars that are stuck in fields around the Midwest going and drive them out. It's kind of his his thing. And um, he makes a great living doing that, probably as much as he would make, if not more, if he got a real job as an engineer. <laughs> so I just think it's exciting. Um, the, the future of entertainment and where we get our information, um, it's changing rapidly. And YouTube, I think, is a fundamental part of that, that strategy, because whether it's entertainment, as it is in this guy's case, or whether it's informative, uh, I've published some YouTube things 
as I fix things, I'm a gearhead. I work in my garage, uh, mostly on uh, restoring old Porsches. It's, it's a hobby of mine. And so as I do things and I find a solution to a problem, I create, create a little YouTube video of it and I throw it online. You know, I used to go to a forum and type stuff out and throw up a couple of pictures, which was still helpful, of course. And lots of people learned how I fix something. And I've learned, uh, of course, paid it back, so to speak, by watching how they solve things. But if a picture's worth a thousand words, a video's worth a million words, right? And um, I think that that's uh, whether YouTube is just entertainment or I think really YouTube being as much about how industry and businesses communicate. Uh, my own software company, which I still run, which which was when I started as a college student, you know, we've gone to putting a lot more content on YouTube now and a lot less content in the form of white papers at technical conferences. I mean, that's used to be, you know, how you disseminated information about new products and concepts and ways of working. But we're finding that year after year, fewer and fewer people read those papers. And while at the same time, we're getting an explosion and the number of people who watch a YouTube video I put together on how to do a flow diagram of a plant layout. Now, I have one that I put on YouTube. Uh, I just checked yesterday. 52,000 people watched that video versus the white paper I wrote at around the same time. I have around 152 downloads. It's just no question that videos and online collaboration are transforming um, not just entertainment, but the business landscape of how people get things done. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about Pro Planner, what it is, how it came to be, and tell us your perspectives on manufacturing over the course of your company's history. It's interesting question. I started, as I mentioned, doing training and stuff as an undergraduate on computers. I learned computers because I actually got a job on campus as one of the first students hired to run a PC computer lab. Um, I know it's hard for our listeners to probably imagine this, but um, I was one of those as well. I'm sure you were much deeper on the technical side of things. I was more there just to make sure that nobody, you know, wrecked or, or downloaded anything they shouldn't. That was my <laughs> that yeah, was my you task. Yeah, this was before the Internet. So we um, the PC had come out in 81 and I got hired in the lab. Um, they created the labs in um, basically the spring of 1983. And uh, we got uh five labs of 26 personal computers, um, dual floppy disk drives, um, no mouse, um, just keyboard, um, although mouses came not, mice came not too far later, you know, no network. Um, if you wanted to print something out, you had to go flip switches to connect to your computer to the printer um, and, and get your to print out. Uh, I said no hard drives, no networks, there were dual floppy disks, one for your program that you had to check out with your uh, Iowa State ID. And the other one, you brought a data disk in to upload and download your data. A uh, green text screen, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> real basic stuff. And um, you're right. I was hired there not just to keep people from breaking things and stealing things, but also to check out the software. Because like a book, you had to check it out. If I wanted to write a word processing, I went to the front desk. I gave, They gave me their ID. I gave them the disk to do word processing. They put it in the left drive. They put their data disk in the right drive, and they word process. And when they were done... You know, and they wanted to now go use a spreadsheet. They gave me their word processing disk back, and uh, I checked them out a Lotus uh, disk for spreadsheets. That I know it's just, I'm sure, hard for people to understand. Oh, what I remember my experience. father. My father worked with this technology when I was young. The 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 floppy disk, the wide, uh, you know, the that, multiple drives, everything. I know. Yeah, I, I still recall that's, it. That's how it happened. You know, it's kind of amazing that it even took off as. as as crazy as it was, but, but that was how it got started. And I, you know, my point of, of this uh, to your question is that um, I was in that lab. I ended up working probably 25, 30 hours a week, more than I was supposed to. Uh, and I showed so many people how to do so many things, how to use AutoCAD. How to use, I became really, really good at it. And while I was, um, uh, I ended up going to grad school, not because I was a good student, but oddly enough, because the department chair came up to me and since I was managing, I was fixing the computers in our department. And they, that was before we actually had IT staff. There really was no such thing back then. He said, hey, have you ever thought about going to grad school? And I'm kind of going, well, you know, I've got a 2.6 grade point. I haven't been a great student. And, you know, I'm really busy with my business idea. I think I'll you know, just go get a real job. 
And I said, I probably couldn't pass the interest exam anyway. And he goes, don't worry about the entrance exam. <laughs> if you want to do it, you're in. And guess what? The next day I'm in grad school. So, you know, you know then I'm confronted with what am I going to do for a master's thesis? And I'm also confronted with the challenge of, you know, is this training gig going to last forever? And how long, you know, can I write computer programs for people? And so one of the, uh, I was a, also a teaching assistant when I entered grad school for our facility layout class. And I was the one student who got us onto AutoCAD because prior to that, you did all the facility layout drawings with pencil and paper on a big uh, sheet of paper. And um, in so doing, of course, we made students draw flow diagrams through the facility of how the parts flow through the plant. And so I wrote a little application to automate that where you could just pick your AutoCAD blocks of your machines, specify the names of them in a spreadsheet, and the software would go in and automatically draw all the flow diagrams in their AutoCAD drawing for them automatically, and then extract the distances of those lines back out to a spreadsheet. So they could calculate in one layout alternative, the part moved seven miles, and in another layout alternative, the parts only moved three miles, right? So that layout must be better. Little unbeknownst to me, you know, I had actually created the first factory layout analysis tool. Um, and so I was looking for a master's thesis and my department chair was really enthralled with this utility I wrote for that lab in that senior design capstone plant layout class. So he asked me to go uh, present this to their uh, the industry exchange because every engineering department has a, a steering committee of working professionals who, uh, you know, give guidance to the department on what's going on in industry. And so I presented what this utility I wrote, and, and I'll have to admit it was a really fun meeting for me because. That's how I got to meet, you know, the deers and the Maytags and the Pella Windows and other people in Iowa who were in this camp. They, they go, this is amazing. You know, we would love to have a tool like this. And so I started doing that as a service to them as part of my little side gig. And then my major professor said, hey, maybe that's a good candidate for a master's thesis. And then, of course, I eventually turned that into my first company, or was, which actually had its first real name. And that was called Sim Technologies back in 1987. And so... That was it. I, I wrote plant layout add-ons for the AutoCAD system. And I, I launched that company in 1987. And we became the largest provider of factory layout software for AutoCAD in the world. I actually sold the company for several million dollars in 97 and went to work as a vice president for the company that bought it. And I did that for about five years, um, during which, of course, we expanded greatly from plant layout. We did line balancing. We did time studies. We did ergonomics assessment we started to do something we call manufacturing change management, where we deal with, you know, the process of changing an assembly line or moving things around in the factory. Uh, then we started to do shop floor work instructions and manufacturing execution systems really branched out. And that's when the internet came out, the late nineties. And I saw in the internet, what I saw when the PC came out, I saw a game changer. I saw that this was going to change people's lives and that the days of buying software and having someone come out and install it on your computer and train you in face-to-face -face were over. Now, clearly the internet back in that time, uh, 98, 99, was very, very new. We were, we were lucky if you get enough bandwidth on your modem to, to even download a picture of something in text. But uh, we knew those things would go away and, and that you know maybe someday... Uh, music or videos could even be downloaded over the internet. Although, of course, back then that was heresy. That was impossible. <laughs> that could never happen. Right? But little did fact, they know. <laughs> one of the companies that bought the company that bought my company. So it's you know big fish eating bigger fish. I became director of manufacturing at a company called EDS, which was a very large technology company, kind of a competitor to IBM. The youngest director uh, in the entire uh, corporation. It's in my low 30s at that time when most of the people were in their 50s. And uh, I said, you know what? You know, all this software stuff we're doing is going to go away. You know, it's all going to go on the Internet. And everybody's just mocking me, of course. Um, and, and basically, at that time, um, you know, we had a crash in the technology world financially. There was a technology crash around uh, 99 to 2000. And so we were laying lots of people off in the software industry. and. Uh, it's kind of a bit of a software bubble. And um, I had an opportunity to negotiate to take my technology back with the license to launch it on the internet. 
And so I created a company called ProPlanner in 2002. It actually was the end of 2001, but we incorporated in 2002 to basically offer this entire set of manufacturing software on the internet. Now, once again, 2002 was still very early uh, for that kind of thing on the internet, but we knew it was going to happen and we wanted to be the first people there. And that's how ProPlanner got started. So it was really an extension of my college company, uh, SimTech, which I started in 87. By 2002, I had essentially relaunched the idea of using the internet as the base. And uh, that's what I'm doing today. So had it not been for the dot-com bust, you might have gone a different direction, you think, or you still would have stayed the course? Oh, definitely. The dot-com bust was key. You know, this isn't directly related to your story, but I think it's important for people to to hear. Uh, You know, corporate America, there's a lot of people at very large corporations that get there that want to keep their job. In other words, that's their job, to not make a decision where they lose their job. You know, as an entrepreneur, it never escaped my mind, you know, that I was there to be earning a paycheck, that 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 was my primary purpose for being. A typical entrepreneur's attitude at work is, what can I create today, right? What markets can I disrupt? What new amazing changes can I make in the world today? You know, the fact that I collect a paycheck doing it, well, that's kind of cool, right? But when you get into corporate America, there's a lot of people who got there, right, with toil and sweat and basically doing what they were told to do and not screwing up for 30 or 40 or 50 years. And so you put an entrepreneur in that environment and it's a very interesting dynamic. (laughs) So I'm sitting here as a 30 year old kid telling a bunch of 50 and 60 year old men, because, of course, that's what corporate America was then that the entire basis of their existence, right? Selling software, training people on software, installing software on computers is going to go away. That that people are going to download this stuff and learn it on their own. And they're going to pay, you know, for using it as a service because at the end of the day, software is a service, right? There really is no product per se. And they're looking at me like, you know, if that ever happens, in fact, one of the guys said, if that ever happens, we're out of business. That's not how we make money, right? In fact, my uh, executive, the vice president of EDS said to me uh, in 2000, the internet will never be a serious business tool. (laughs) Okay. So think about that. Okay. Now, note the first internet browser was invented in 97, only three years earlier. And in 2000, most people didn't even have enough bandwidth on their modem to, you know, do much on the internet. It it was truly was a, you know, startup today, but that's my point, you know, so I quit my job. Um, Basically I I took the license agreement. I quit my job. I was making almost $250,000 a year, which was a lot of money in 2000. Needless to say, uh, my wife wasn't totally bought onto the idea. that. She needed a little extra convincing, is what you're saying? A extra convincing. Let me just tell the, the people listening to this podcast, if you're going to do a, a lifestyle change like that, it's a good idea to talk to your spouse first. But <laughs> That's I'm good still advice. Married, so, uh, oh, she, there you go. Yeah, she did forgive me. <laughs> I think my point is that um, I did, I left and um, I did this. I've not looked back. Odd, funny part of the story is um, EDS two years later, I think it was, ended up getting basically absorbed into Hewlett Packard. And um, most of the people that I worked with uh, um, lost their job in one form or another over the next two or three years. So these people that thought that I was, right, the crazy, risky guy going off and doing this entrepreneurial venture. Why would anyone leave this guaranteed, secure job that they were in? You know, I I, I had a great opportunity a few years later to have some of those people call me up and say, you know, if I had only, you know, had the perspective on life that you had at the time, I might have made different decisions. And so, you know, when we talk about entrepreneurship training at Iowa State, it's not just a skill. It's a mindset. And uh, you need the mindset and the skill set to be successful. Well, I think that's the thing about uh, guarantees. There's this, there just there just aren't any. You you, no. you you just don't know. You have to see the the forest through the trees sometimes, and hope that uh, there's still time. You know, I, as it brings up another interesting story. So, what I've interviewed for one job in my life when I was a grad student, when I got frustrated, I told you about that. I decided. Maybe I'll get a real job. 
And the career fair was that week. So it was very timely. So I created a resume, really nice resume, you know, printed on a really nice paper, made sure the watermark was aligned. I bought a really nice suit because, of course, I didn't have one. And I went into my interview. The one and only interview of my life was Texas Instruments, which was a technology company. They're still around. Um, they actually even made the PC computers back then. They, they haven't made them for many years. But at that time, I remember I made $35,000, I think, was what I had made that year, which was still a lot of money as a college student. OK, back in 2002, inflation is about 3x. That was about $100,000 in today's money. I had a DeLorean. I had a really great motorcycle. Still have the DeLorean, by the way. And I actually still have the motorcycle. I never sold either one of them. But um, my point is that the guy looks at me across the table and asks what I'm doing there. And I said, well, I want a job. Right? And he looks at me and he says, you made $35,000 the last year. And you're applying for a $25,000 starting salary job because that's what industrial engineers made then. What's wrong with this picture? He says, you make more money last year than I did. Why are you here? Why are you wasting my time? And I told him that story that you just mentioned about. I have no idea if I'm going to make 35000 next year. I have no idea you know, if, if what I'm doing is even going to be wanted or viable. <laughs> what I want is a guaranteed job. You know, I want the 401k plan or oh, I didn't know what it was. I mean, it was a retirement plan. I wanted health care. Sure. I wanted, you know, the country club membership. I wanted the, you know, the house in the suburbs. I want the dream. And he proceeds to tell me, you know, at Texas Instruments, we don't know if your product line is going to succeed tomorrow or not either. And if your product line that you're on doesn't succeed, you go into a pool of engineers and you get picked up by another product line or we give you your two weeks notice and you're gone. He said, don't don't assume for one second that working in the corporate world has these guarantees that you've been led to believe, okay? And it was really eye-opening for me. I never looked back at that point, um, that and talking to my mentor, I said, all right, you know, I'm in this, you know, for better or for worse, I'm going to make this work. That was the last uh, I looked at that. That's a huge leap of faith in my book. I'll, I'll give you that. You've been working and you've been going to school all at the same time for a long stretch. You're an Iowa State Cyclone through and through, four degrees over 20 plus years from the university. Uh, you were even working, I think, on your PhD as you were founding Pro Planner, if I'm not mistaken. What did you learn at each level of your academic path, undergraduate, graduate, postgraduate, that helped you develop the entrepreneur mindset? Or in your case, more specifically to say, how did it evolve as you did that? Yeah, how did it evolve? You know, um, you know, I, probably the, the evolution started being in college as an undergrad, which I'm sure many of the listeners perhaps can relate to, without financial support. I was working on campus originally at a place like Target. It's called TGY. I don't think they're in business anymore, but it was like a Target type store. I was working there so that I could pay my tuition, so that I could buy my food, and so that I could, you know, have a place to live. Uh, if I didn't work, if I didn't bring in money, you know, obviously I'm not going to say I didn't have parents that were helpful. They were, but they just didn't have the financial means to put me through school. Sure. They helped me. Now, I'm very good help, much more help than even some other parents have given students. But I, I basically had to pay most of it myself, especially after my first year. And so, um, for me, entrepreneurship mindset was about survival. And I kind of brought that up earlier in this talk. I think that there's nothing like needing to succeed to help someone succeed. <laughs> and I didn't have a choice. I had to make money somehow. And obviously, being an industrial engineer, I wanted to make the most amount of money in the least amount of time possible. <laughs> So good, good productivity uh, there. So my best friend is a graduate of Georgia Tech. He said that exact thing to me. And he is also an industrial engineering grad. <laughs> you know, it, it, it isn't just IEs. Of course, you know, we all know that IEs are, are the smartest of all engineers. But regardless of, of that biased perspective. I'm sure no one in our audience is going to disagree. I'm sure no one's yeah, going to disagree. I think that we see a lot of disagreement there. Uh, you know, we never see this from a mechanical engineer, for example. Right. <laughs> No, you know, it, I think it's true for just about anybody uh, about mindset. I mean, it certainly helps put your mind, in, you know, in when you've made the commitment. This is how you're making your living. I, I think that, um, you know, going to school for me, um, I wasn't a great student. 
And I wasn't a motivated student my first few years. I was there to get the piece of paper. Okay, I'll admit it. But when I started writing programs for people, not that I was a great programmer. Remember, I was an industrial engineering student. But um, I had taken a programming class and uh, learned how to do basic programming. And I had learned how to use these software programs online. And it created, it created a level of curiosity and interest in me where I actually started to get into the courses that I was taking. And it was really transformative for me. My grades did improve, even though I was working more, right? My last semester, I took like 18 credits. I was probably working literally 60 hours a week. I had the best grades ever because I was focused and I was applying what I was learning when I was learning it. And as you can tell, as I told you, I went to grad school and worked on my first product as my master's thesis. What a great opportunity to put all my energy in something that just didn't sit on a bookshelf, but something that I actually turned into a product and sold and made a living on, right? Which is pretty rare if you're no master's theses uh, in any engineering field. And needless to say, the courses I took as a master's degree student were courses to help me write that program, right? So I took programming classes because once again, I hadn't had any real programming class. I just had IE teachers teach me how to program. I, I didn't take any in comm sci or computer engineering. So I, I took all of my electives in computer engineering and computer science and really uh, applied what I was learning when I was learning. And it's a heck of a lot easier to do that and be successful than it is to take a class that you have no relationship or interest in because you simply can't correlate it to anything in the real world. I got my master's degree. Um, and then the next thing that happened to me was, you know, my business started to take off and I was hiring people and I had to learn marketing and finance. And I actually had to be a business person. And as you mentioned, I've never worked anywhere in my life. So it was recommended to me. Iowa State had just launched a Saturday MBA program. Recommended to me that maybe I need to get this Saturday MBA program. So I did after my master's thesis, I did uh, because I was doing consulting. I thought it'd be a good idea to get a PE. I did take a year and get my PE passed the test, you know, and, and got people to sign for me and passed my second test. And right after I did that, literally, I signed up for the Saturday MBA program with my uh, with my wife. She was a bachelor's degree in, um, business major, and she thought it was a good idea, too. So we signed up together. We were in different groups the whole time. But for the next three years, every Saturday, uh, we did classes and, you know, did homework. But once again, through the entire MBA program, every marketing assignment I did, you know, every financial planning assignment I did, every project we did was always on my company. And during those years, I was doubling revenue and profitability every year, largely because I was learning how to run a business while I was actually running a business. What a great learning environment. And I ended up getting so much out of the MBA, a big, big uh, proponent of MBA programs for all engineers, including industrial. And then I kind of took a hiatus. You know, I had my master's and I had my MBA, master's of industrial engineering and my MBA. I had a PE. That was all I needed. Well, in 2002, when I left EDS to start Pro Planner, I'm sitting at my desk. It was just me and a few other people envisioning, you know, this new web-based initiative. And I thought, you know, it might be good for me to, you know, learn some more about the cloud and the internet and networking and things that I didn't know a lot about. Plus, there were certain things that, you know, had happened in engineering that I thought would also be good for me to know. So I ended up um, enrolling in the PhD program and teaching part-time at the university, which was also great because I got health benefits. And anyone who knows who's self-employed knows that health benefits are expensive. So they needed some help in teaching. I could use the health benefits and a little extra income while I was starting my new business. And um, also it gave me, a, gave me a great opportunity to interact with lots of great grad students, many of which I ended up hiring uh, while I was taking classes. <laughs> and, uh, and in basically 18 months, developed another software product, our web-based product, which I turned into my doctoral dissertation and finished my coursework. And actually, I was exactly 24 months from the date I graduated with my PhD uh, with a, my first product launch of ProPlanner, the cloud-based industrial engineering tool. So um, I've always used these grad degrees as a way to learn and practice and hone what it was I was doing, you know, as opposed to treating it as, you know, this other thing that I'm doing. It was really integral to me being successful. All three degree, all three graduate degrees, and you could say the same thing's true about my undergrad, but uh, all three graduate degrees in particular were instrumental into helping me launch those companies. As we bring this to a close, whether someone is early in their career, deep in the middle, or seeking a twilight reinvention, let's say, what's the first step 
for the wannabe entrepreneur? How should they evaluate the potential of their quote unquote big idea? It's super important, I think, for any entrepreneur to get and to seek validation. And there's only one way to get validation, really. And that is to build something that looks a lot like your product. If, if you can't build the actual product, I mean, ideally you build the actual product, but you'll never build the final product probably right off the bat. You'll build something that's kind of close and get it in as many, in front of many people as you can. Um, you know, had I not written that utility for plant layout as a college student and then went to John Deere and made it, and, and they saw it, right? They saw it, they physically saw how the students' class were using it to do what they were doing. If they hadn't seen that, and they didn't care, they wouldn't ask me to do it at their plants. And when they asked me to do it at their plants, and then they paid me to do it, and then they asked if they could buy the software product, which I then had to write <laughs> <laughs> professionally, not just as a clue, right? Of course. That, that is what I'm defining as validation, right? We, we had some students in my entrepreneurship class, as part of their validation, they came up with an idea of putting uh, solar panels on rollout awnings on RVs. And they went to social media. They went to a uh, to Facebook page for RVers that like to go out in the, the country. They made a little survey. Say, hey, we're some college students from Iowa State Engineering. We're doing this entrepreneurial endeavor. We've got this vision. And they had a really nice 3D video of how it was going to work. It was all mocked up, right? It was all uh, artistry and all made up. But it looked like you know, a real product. Within 24 hours, they had about... 15 people asking how to put a deposit down on their idea. By the end of the first week, they had over 250 potential orders. That is validation. That means the market cares. It cares enough that at the price point the students were talking about, they knew they knew they could build it for less than that, right? There's your validation of entrepreneurship. It's not just an innovation. It's just not, it's not a product that costs $100,000 to make that you can sell for 10 grand, right? It's, it's a product that you could actually sell for a price greater than what it costs you to produce it. True entrepreneurship. So my recommendation to anyone who comes to me and wants to be an entrepreneur, who has this idea, who has this next period, but wants to, wants to take it, I ask them to define what a good valid validation would be. You know, what, what would anyone undeniably say, yeah, this is a good idea, right? And uh, write that down. How do you validate? And then go seek that validation. And once you get it, once you get people saying, where do I sign? How can I buy? I'm willing to pay this amount for your product. Then you can take it to the next level. But don't get, don't get overboard with your business plan and your, you know, your, your logo. And don't go out and get your bank loans all lined up, as I've seen so many students do before they've got any validation for their idea whatsoever. Focus on the idea of validation first. Make sure it is the next big idea. And don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid to tweak it and then try again and tweak it and try again. I mean, part of learning about pain is to just see how people get frustrated doing things and say, how can I make that better, right? And uh, uh, and then make it better, prototype it, and, and put it in people's hands. And that's fairly easy to do with software. It's easy to mock things up that look like software. People have been selling PowerPoint presentations as software for years. Uh, but uh, a little harder with physical prototypes, of course, with 3D rapid prototyping, right? It's easier today than ever was, or with virtual reality type 3D CAD modeling capabilities, you can build things and create videos of things that you swear actually exist, right? Look at those um, robotic companies. Anybody have seen those videos of the, you know, the robots that are all working on to get Boston Robotics? And a lot of those videos, some of them are real, of course, but a number of those videos were actually done, you know, completely with computer graphics. Uh, the dancing robots and the fighting robots and stuff like that. But you'd swear they were real. And that's the kind of realism that you need to get validation. Or somebody looks at that and says, where do I sign? I want to buy that. That's what you need to focus your idea on. So I think that's where, where all the effort should be. Well, it certainly fits the industrial engineering spirit, I would say, uh, regardless of whether they're engineers or not. Dave, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us about entrepreneurship. And I'm certain our listeners, especially the young professionals, uh, gained so much from this conversation. I know I certainly did. Uh, Dave, thanks again for joining us. Hey, thanks a lot, David. I really appreciate you, you giving this important topic of engineering entrepreneurship, in particular industrial engineering entrepreneurship, uh, so much attention. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of Problem Solved, the IISC podcast, a production of the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers in Metro Atlanta. This podcast is produced by David Brandt, Keith Albertson, and Michael Hughes, and edited by David Brandt. You can listen to all episodes of Problem Solved and learn about sponsorship opportunities by visiting our website, podcast.iise.org. You can also learn more about IISE at the Institute's website, www.iise.org.